All right, folks, good to see everybody. Welcome to the Modche Dub and Pesach Halevi Sunday morning Torah class. Okay, I can't see. And good news then. So the good news telephone. Okay. Let us begin. Okay. Jacob, would you start us off, please? In witness, the path to posterity. Inwardness, the path to posterity, a lasting legacy. All of us want to be remembered. We want our lives to bring something lasting into the world. This is the message of Parshas Toga, that a person can leave a legacy that will continue to thrive after his passing. Our rabbis offer two definitions of the word Toga. A, progeny. This includes a person's biological children and his spiritual ch children, in other words, individuals whom he has taught. Both types of children perpetuate a person's influence. Okay, so our sages say, we say this in the Shema twice a day at least. You shall teach to your children, in addition to the obligation to educate our own children entrusted to us, it refers in general to students. For a child, a student is a spiritual child, the father, a spiritual teacher. So one kind of progeny, therefore, are our offspring, physical offspring and spiritual offspring. Okay, let's continue. And B, the, the chronicles of one's life and experiences. In other words, when a person's life is filled with inner meaning, stories about his life provide inspiration for people in coming generations. Right, so then it's the, the second thing is the person himself. Just him as an example, or her as an example. The life lived with content and meaning, so that itself becomes a legacy, their own personal example. I should point out, I don't know, I didn't read the text, so... It's all based on the Rebbe Sichas, but it, it's to be pointed out that one should not live a life in order to leave a legacy. Um, or moreover, be even concerned about one's legacy. It isn't about one's legacy, it's about, it's about the truth. Um, although sometimes it's helpful to think in these terms, especially initially, because we are all born selfish creatures. That's how God made us, that's our conscious self. And so it's helpful for a person to think, well, what are they gonna say about me when I die? Well, what would my eulogy be like? And if that's going to uh, be a reason to do good things, and so be it, even though it's completely selfish and self-serving, but it's far better than the alternative, not doing, not doing good things. In the words of our sages, a person should always begin in his initial stage of service, not for the sake of heaven, meaning for the sake of self, for one's name, uh, one's reward, and so on. That's the initial. <laughs> Jacob, you'll um, just, okay, well, I'm just mute you all. Okay, um, that's the initial stage. And then hopefully we progress to doing what's right, not because of the reward, not because of a legacy, but because this is what Hashem wants. Now, what Hashem wants, in fact, is for us to leave a legacy. We need to influence the world. So one ought to be concerned about the legacy, not on a personal level, but that whatever I have contributed should continue because it's not my contribution. I started something godly and holy and that should continue. It's not the me, it's what, it's the, the Torah things that I achieved in the world. So the first, you know, uh, progeny, the first legacy, children, that's part of my mission is to educate and bring up children, both literal and, and uh, spiritual children. 
and my experiences. I should be an example. I should, my story should be inspiring an example. Why? That I'll be remembered? That's the height of selfishness. Not that I'll be remembered. That because when people remember this, or they'll be inspired to do what's right and Hashem's purpose will be realized. That's the ultimate goal. Few people reach that or even close to it. But it is something to strive for. At least, at very least, to be aware that thoughts of legacy and uh, reward or recognition, etc., at least know where it's coming from. It's the animal soul, it's egotistic, and it's actually the Yetzirah at its root. However, as we said, uh, one should begin and can, can only begin motivated selfishly. And then only through great toil can one strip away those layers of selfishness of ego, which is a lifelong struggle. Hopefully we're in the game. All right, Jacob, read another piece because it was a short one, if you don't mind. You, you're not. Right? You can hear me? Yeah, you weren't muted. Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. A fountain of inner strength. With whom does the Torah choose to associate the message of Torah? Yitzchak. So that's, that's kind of interesting. It's interesting that Torah, which means progeny, legacy, what's the word he used? Posterity, which is what the word Torah means, and it's two levels we just said. The Torah says, associates that not with Avram and not with Yaakov, but with Yitzchak. Why? We're going to explain. Two things reflect the nature of Yitzchak's divine service. A, unlike his father Avraham, he never left Eretz Yisrael. And B, his efforts were focused on digging wells. That's what we know about Yitzchak. He redug his father's wells. He dug his own wells. And that's pretty much the only thing we learn about his life. He'll now explain, continue. Abraham spread godliness in the lands in which he sojourned. He proclaimed to the entire world that there is one God and it is befitting to serve him. He would travel from city to city and from country to country, gathering people and proclaiming God's existence. Continue, yep. Yitzchak, by contrast, never traveled outside the Holy Land. And even within Eretz Yisrael, we do not find many stories of his efforts to reach out to others. His divine service had an inward focus. In which way was he different than Noah in that case? Then? One second. In which, in, in which way was he different than Noah? I mean, he never, he, you know, he didn't go out and search and reach out. Oh, yeah. Okay. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. Just want to point out here that that we read in the parsha this week's parsha we're going to read that when there's a famine in Israel, unlike Avram that leaves, Hashem tells Yitzchak, "You stay, good ba'aretz azo is not to go." And Rashi explains he may bring this later that Yitzchak is considered all his life to be an offering to God. He was ready to give up his life. And a, a, a sacred offering, the, the ascent offering, the Korban Oila, which we're learning about in the 8.30 uh, Sunday morning shir these days. The Korban Oila, of that matter, any sacrifice, um, even those that are parts of which are eaten, may not be eaten outside, in some cases, the temple grounds, in other cases, sacrifices of lesser sanctity, um, the confines of Jerusalem. So since Yitzchak was the consummate offering, he could not leave the Holy Land like an offering whose meat is taken out of the Holy Temple becomes invalidated. So unlike Avram, who traveled extensively, Yitzchak spent most of his life in, in one location for that matter, in Beersheba. Now, the other thing he did was dig, was dig wells, because the point he just said was his service had an inward focus. So Avram is projecting outwards, Yitzchak inwards. Let's see more about this. Can, please continue reading. 
This is reflected in his, in, in his preoccupation with digging wells. Digging a well involves removing layers of earth to uncover hidden sources of life-giving water. Spiritually, digging refers to the work of reaching one's godly core and tapping it as a source of inner strength. Each of us has a neshama, which is an actual part of God. Every entity is maintained by a godly spark. Yitzhak's goal was to activate these inner potentials, bring them to the surface, and use them to initiate positive change. Let's, let's finish to the end of the section, and I'll, I'll comment a little bit. Go on. In this manner, the awareness of God becomes an integral part of one's life. It does not remain dependent on the teachings of others, but comes from one's own insight. This, in turn, enables one to realize the godliness present in every element of existence. Continue? Yeah, just finish, yeah. Right. In this context, our sages interpret the verse, dwell in this land, as cause the divine presence to rest in this land, help the world manifest its godly core. That was God's response to the famine. He was considering leaving like Avram did down to Egypt. And God said not to dwell in the land. The deeper meaning is cause the divine presence to dwell in this land. So what are we saying? We're saying that Avram, in contrast to Yitzchak, which will also explain Yitzchak in contrast to Noyach. Yitzchak builds on Avraham. It's a continuum. Avraham and Sarah inspired tens of thousands, at least, um, to embrace God, to reject idolatry, and paganism and so on. They did so as we learned through traveling, through their inspiration, through their incredible hospitality. In their orbit, one was inspired. But strangely, the Torah says very little about these people after Avram's and Sarah's passing. That's because the next stage, the Yitzchak stage, is an internal process. Inspiration is what begins our journey, but then we must take ownership of it, and it must come from within. That's a dogged process. That's a very individual process, and that's what Yitzchak represents. You must now make the effort to come here, as it were. You're inspired. Journey now on your own further. Digging the wells means you've got to seek to bring up those living waters the divine spark that was within you to the fore. So you're right, Yitzchak, if he had been the founder of our people, then that yeah, kind probably. of divine service would have achieved nothing and Noah at best. But he follows Avram. He looked like Avram. He was Avram's heir. He was the next link, the next, the next necessary uh, step in the service of God, and that is inspiration, wonderful, you're born Jewish, you're educated, each one has their story. But now it has to come through our own dogged effort from within. So Yitzchak is not going to orchestrate this as Avram did. He'll help in our journey, but the journey must be ours. He's almost the, the, the link between Avraham and Yaakov, right? I mean, he's like the... Uh... He is the link, and therefore Yaakov's children are all righteous and, and go out there and uh, eventually conquer the world, enter Israel, etc. Yeah, Yaakov being the synthesis of both. But I'm reminded, I'm reminded of uh, the Rebbe's statement, literally the mission statement, that the Rebbe said that the historic Fabrengen of the 11th of Shvat 1951, it was the 11th hour, it was in the 11th hour, it was 10 something, 10.30 something p.m. at night, already in the 11th hour of the 11th day, of the 11th month, of the 11th year, 1951, 5711, 5711. So this is the historic Fabrengen that Baruch Hashem is actually recorded, we have it, it's published, 
and the Rebbe edited it. And he said then the mission statement, he said, like he said, he, he prefaced by saying that when you come, the Talmud says, when you come to a country, the one should adopt its practices. Of course, if not in, in conflict with, one should respect the practices uh, if it's, when they're not in conflict with Torah. So he says in America, like it is a statement, and people expect a statement from, when, when, from the a new position or, or whatever it might be. So he said, so we'll make a statement as is in the American, the custom here in America where we live. So the mission statement was in essence that there are three loves, love of God, love of the Jewish people, love of Torah, and they're inseparable. And one can not have one without the other. If one says I love God and love Torah, but doesn't love his fellow Jew, unconditionally in every one of them, then he's, he's missing his love of God and Torah and so on. And in, in the course of that, Fabrenian, he said, he said these words, the following words. He says, he will not shy away from helping. But everybody has to know that the responsibility lies on each one individual. He said in Yiddish, I will not spare any help. In other words, everything that I can, I will give and more. He didn't say that, but he did. But Nizhalovin, it's a Russian Jewish word. We're not going to hold back. It's about what will help, he says, if all of that is given and each one of you do not work on your own personal lives and on your own individual contribution to the great mission, and it's all for naught. So really he's saying Yitzchak. He's saying this is the Yitzchak mode now. Inspiration has been given, the teachings have been given, and will continue to. But now you've got to be the Yitzchak. You've got to dig those wells, uncover the divine in every aspect of your life, in every Jew you meet, and in every, in every encounter with every human being. We are all shluchim, is what the Rebbe said then in 1951, but very explicitly and powerfully in the last address, which was this past Shabbos, 1992 is before Mashiach, Mashiach comes. It was the last address to the Shluchim. This is this week is always the annual convention of the Shluchim. So uh, it was 30 years ago that the Rebbe then said that every Jew should need to know, and now is the time that every Jew is a Shliach of Nisi Dereno, of the Moses of our generation. You didn't refer to himself, you referred to the previous Rebbe. Everyone has a shliach to do his or her part to bring about redemption. So let's continue. All right, thank you. Let's continue. Ricky, please. Inwardness, which leads outward. <clears throat> this is surely a worthy path of divine service. But why is it associated with the name Toldos, which means progeny? It would seem more appropriate to associate the concept of Toldos with the divine service of Avraham, for he actively sought to communicate the awareness of God to others. So the word Toldos means what you produce. So who was the one that taught and inspired it? It's Avraham. Yitzchak is subtle, it's inward, it's silent, it's not production, it's not progeny. And yet the Torah associates progeny, not this word, this key word, not with Avram, but with Yitzchak. And so continue, Ricky, please. By naming this reading told us, our rabbis underscore the fact that the inwardness of Yitzchak also produces progeny. Yitzchak's divine service and the positive influence it generated attracted the attention of others and motivated them to follow his guidance. In this vein, our Torah reading relates that Avimelech, king of the Philistines, and Fichol, his general, came to visit Yitzchak and told him, we have seen that God is with you. In other words, what he's saying is that the ultimate effect, the ultimate effect on your children and the environment is not your teachings. That's Avram, although you must teach them. You've got to tell them what's right and what's wrong but it's your example. Our example is what makes the deepest effect. And that's not a, a flashy thing. 
It's very quiet and introverted, but it's real. And that is the message that told us the lasting effect in the end will be not what you said or even what you did, but who you are. Namely, that you, we, are the embodiment sincerely and internally of the message. Let's continue. Continue, Vicky. Yitzchak's divine service. Yitzchak divine service brought them to a recognition of God's active presence in the world. Indeed, the awareness inspired by Yitzchak was more permanent than that generated by Avraham, for it came from the people themselves. Yitzchak's internalized, internalized bond with God inspired the people around him to perceive God's influence. The Rebbe actually addressed this too in his final address 30 years ago. He asked the following question on the Parsha. It's a famous question, and that is the Torah devotes so much detail and description it, and repeats the whole story of Eliezer finding the wife for Rivka. Whereas the actual marriage of Yitzhak and Rivka is described in a few sentences or less. But the whole search is described in great length and repeated. And he explained, because the marriage of Yitzchak and Rivka represents the Messianic era. As he explains here at length, our relationship with God is a marriage and the consummation of that marriage is when Mashiach comes. Torah was the betrothal, when Mashiach comes, it's the actual ultimate union. And all of creation, all of existence was created for that, for that, for that union, union to be manifest on earth, represented by Yitzchak and Rivka. So why does the Torah <clears throat> place so much emphasis on the search? The Rebbe says, because we, all of us, who are the shluchim of Hashem, to bring about the Messianic era, it all rests on our avoida. It's not just the results, but who we are. The Torah focuses on Eliezer, the Shliach, because like Yitzchak, in order to bring about this great change, this great cosmic wedding, it's got to be reflected in not just what we say and do, but who we are, which is reflected in what we say and do. Therefore, the whole emphasis is on the actual Shlichus itself. The Shliach himself must be an embodiment of that which he wants to achieve. He must be a little Mashiach on earth. And that's every single one of us. And that's the, that's the Yitzchak message. Okay, let's continue. To communicate to our children, in the most complete sense, our desire to be remembered is focused on our children. We want them to continue and further our principles and values. And here a difficulty arises. Yitzchak's children were Esau and Yaakov. Yaakov indeed perpetuated and enhanced Yitzchak's divine service. Esav, however, rejected Yitzchak's path entirely. Moreover, this difficulty is compounded by the fact that a major portion of the Torah reading concerns itself with Esav. Indeed, on the phrase, and these are the toldos of Yitzchak, the Midrash states that the word toldos refers specifically to Esav. She's asking a very simple question. So Yitzchak is the symbol of progeny? Yaakov should be. Esav rejected his path. So why is Yitzchak the symbol of how to achieve uh, told us, children, progeny, legacy, posterity? Answer. Continue. <clears throat> Although Esav's conduct did not openly demonstrate that he was Yitzchak's son, the connection nevertheless existed. This is reflected by our sage's statement that Esau's head was buried in the bosom of Yitzchak, his father. Similarly, our sages explain that in contrast to Yishmael, who is not considered an heir of Abraham, Esau is considered one of Yitzchak's heirs. For the home of Esau's soul, his head, contained powerful divine sparks associated with Yitzchak. For this reason, Yitzchak desired to give his blessing to Esav rather than to Yaakov. As a father, Yitzchak was constantly struggling to motivate Esav to live up to his spiritual potential 
and he thought that granting these blessings to him would further his purpose, this purpose. So perhaps what he's saying is, why is Yitzchak the symbol of progeny? It's to teach us you don't give up on a Jewish child. Yaakov had it relatively easy. Kids were all good kids. Avram didn't have, Yishmael was not Jewish, born to Hagar, to Keturah, to Hagar. But the Torah says, there's an amazing insight. Your most difficult child, Esau, in the end, is going to be inspired not by anything you say or do, but by who you are. The example, well, that which you do for yourself, but not to him, for him. He'll be inspired by the example that you are, and not to give up. That's why Yitzhak wants to bless him before he dies. He sees the great potential, and in the end, he'll be successful. Yitzhak will be successful with Esau. Let's continue reading. The pattern which God invested in the world, however, is that Esau will not uncover his spiritual potential independently. Instead, it is Jacob and his descendants whose divine service reveal this resource. This is reflected in the labors of the Jewish people in the present exile, identified as the exile of Edom, Esau, to uncover the spiritual potential which Esau possesses. So Yitzchak started the process, not giving up on any Jew, and it continues through Yaakov and his descendants, you and I, till this day. And again, the profound message is at the end of the day, the disenfranchised, the rebellious, the angry child will be drawn back to his or her roots by the example that we are, not by our preaching. So the final consummation, please conclude the paragraph. The final consummation of these efforts will come in the era of the redemption when, when deliverers will go up to Mount Zion to judge the mountain of Esau and the sovereignty will be God's at that time the powerful spiritual energies which Esau possesses will surface and be given appropriate expression okay thank you let's read the last section a source of light for all mankind Yeshua, please. Thank you. Okay. Our, <clears throat> our sages relate that in the era of the redemption, Jews will praise Yitzhak, telling him, you are our patriarch. Now the, context, that, the, the, the context for that, yeah. it's a verse. It's a verse in one of the prophecies that will turn to Yitzhak and not to Avram, and not even to Yaakov. And the Talmud elaborates because both Avram and Yaakov failed to defend the Jewish people as completely and as devotedly as Yitzchak, who argues with the God in defending them. Because Yitzchak is saying, the godliness is there, they're deep down, we just got to keep digging. It's there, don't give up on them. We just have to uncover it. So it's Yitzhak in the end they will turn to specifically, uniquely, you are our father, you defended us in our long and bitter exile and never gave up hope in us. He has an Esau and never gives up hope that Esau will come, not just come around, but reveal his tremendous potential. Hence, he is the one who has the final word. So that's what it means here. From that era, continue. For in that era, the inward thrust of Yitzhak will permeate all existence. The occupation of the entire world will be solely to know God. The Jews will be great sages and will know the hidden matters, attaining an understanding of their creator to the full extent of mortal expression. It's quoting here from the Rambam describing the Messianic era. What's that? It's all a Yitzhak thing. We are involved our pursuit is nothing other than to know god the emphasis is not only god's reveal but the occupation from below to above our our understanding not just as passive recipients but as actively engaged and that's what israq is to uncover that divine soul the core essence that seeks god and wishes to be one with him 
And Yitzchak is saying, everybody has it. We just have to keep on mining, digging, and in the end, be the example, which is the ultimate influence. So it's final paragraph, Yeshua. Although all Jews will then live in Eretz Yisrael, they will, as their ancestor Yitzhak did, influence mankind as a whole, motivating all to seek godly knowledge. And it shall come to pass in the end of days that the mountain of God's house will be established on the top of the mountains, and all the nations shall flow unto it. Many people shall say, come, let us ascend the mountain of God, and he will teach us of his ways. May this take place in the immediate future. Amen. Amen. Thank you all for joining everybody. Have a wonderful week. Good day, Rabbi. Good day. Good week. God bless. All the best. All the yeah. best.